I want you to close your eyes for a moment and imagine something different. That you are Russians. Yes, Russians, citizens of the Russian Federation. Imagine that you're living quietly in some city far away from the din of bombs, far from the Ukrainian front. Perhaps in majestic St. Petersburg, in historic Kazan, or why not, in Moscow itself. Everything seems normal. Your life goes on until one day, suddenly, someone looks you in the eye and asks you a direct question. What do you think of your president, Vladimir Putin, and his war? I'm sure that right now, most of you would have a clear answer. You would condemn the war, and you would give Putin such a failing grade that he wouldn't dare show his face in the Red Square. Am I right? Well, it turns out, visual politic viewers, most Russians don't think like that at all. They neither condemn the war nor reject its president. And it's not important whether we're talking about official surveys or unofficial studies. The reality doesn't change much. Indeed, of the few remaining independent pollsters in Russia, such as the Levada Center, which many of us find hard to believe, less than 20% of the population disagrees with both the war and Vladimir Putin's leadership. And we aren't only talking about Levada. Other polls, such as those of Russian Field or Chronicle Group, paint a similar picture. 77% of Russians still support the war in Ukraine, although 52% would prefer to negotiate rather than continue the violence. But in any case, they continue to support the Kremlin. The rhetoric against the West, the constant propaganda and the fact of not being close to the front line seems to be the main reasons for this situation. But do you know what else is saving the president from popular rejection? Well, it's very simple. Vladimir has no rival in Russia. No one can outshine him. He doesn't even share power with other bigwigs. And right now, I'm sure more than one of you is thinking, why not? You've told us many times about Shoigu, Gerasimov, Petrushev, and even former President Medvedev. And yes, it's true. All these guys have a lot of weight and a lot of influence in Putin's Russia. But let's not fool ourselves. They're all mere puppets. That's the reality, plain and simple. Modern Russia is a Russia tailor-made for its president, Vladimir Putin. 23 years in power have allowed him to mold a nation in his image and likeness. As if he were an ancient czar, Putin has built a society that if we transplanted it back to the Middle Ages, wouldn't be so out of place. A society where the importance and power of the people emanates directly from the all-powerful leader, Vladimir Putin. The oligarchs are the new nobles of the 21st century. They are the courtiers who dance to the rhythm set by the president. Then we have the military and the security forces, who impose Putin's will with an iron fist. And at the bottom of the pyramid, the people. A people who, sadly, play a very minor role. The visual politic community, Putin seems to have it all locked down. However, his regime has not been free of threats. The most recent, and the one many of you will surely remember, was that of the late Wagner Group leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, who came within 200 kilometers of entering Moscow with his troops. Three or four times more than this в документах подается наверх. А то, что подается, это в 10 раз меньше, чем говорят по телевизору. ЧВК «Вагнер» хотели расформировать. Мы вышли 23 июня на Марш Справедливости. As you know, Putin managed to take the bull by the horns and succeeded in stopping the Wagner Group's advance because he prevented any senior military officers from joining that onslaught. And not only that, in the end, the all-powerful leader also exacted his revenge. The rebel Yevgeny Prigozhin, who dared to challenge his authority, met his fate while flying through the skies of Russia. However, despite this victory, the Wagner Group mutiny made one thing very clear. Putin's regime is not untouchable, and he certainly isn't either. In fact, there are those who claim that he has suffered up to 43 assassination attempts. Be that as it may, the point is that right now, the situation in the Ukrainian war seems to be a dead end, both for the Ukrainians and for the Russians. That's why there are those who indicate that Putin's fall would be the solution to all problems. But is this really the case? How exactly could Putin fall? And what would have to happen for his long reign to come to an end? Well, these are the three important questions that we're going to answer in this video. We're going to tell you in detail how Putin could fall, and we'll also analyze if his decline could mean the end of the war and the clash with the West. But before we continue, do you use any fitness apps? Do you know that the top fitness apps collect an average of 15.2 personal data points each from their users, with Fitbit collecting the most at 21? But no worry, no need to panic. At least, don't give up just yet. The good news is that you have the right to protect your privacy by requesting the deletion of any personal information they may have on you. The bad news is that doing this manually could take years. However, thanks to Incogni, today's sponsor, you can solve this issue in just three simple steps. First, create 
create an account with Incogni. Second, give Incogni permission to work on your behalf. They will contact data brokers and request the removal of your personal information. Third, sit back and relax. Incogni will handle everything and keep you updated on their progress at every stage of the process. And the best part, with the code VISUAL, you'll get a 60% discount on your annual plan with Incogni by using the link in the description. Don't miss this chance to protect your privacy. The King's Dethronement. I'm sure many of you find it hard to imagine a Russia without Vladimir Putin. And no wonder, so do we. It's been so long now that Russia almost seems to be directly synonymous with Putin. A president who has turned the country into his private estate, into what's known as an established autocracy. That is, a country where the leader has an absolute monopoly on power, where everything that matters goes through him, and where every decision seems to come from his own pen. Basically, a full-fledged big brother situation. But I'm sure you already know all this. The issue is something else. If history has taught us anything, it's that in times of uncertainty, the unthinkable sometimes becomes reality. So we on Visual Politic have asked ourselves how such a scenario might play out and who might press the red button and take action. And so the first question is, who do you think would be in the best position to remove Putin from power? Surely many of you have a clear idea. His closest circles, the elected elite, that is, that oligarchy that seems to have so much power in the shadows. But what could motivate the courtiers to betray the Tsar? And more importantly, do they have what it takes to do so. Well, pay close attention. Just a few months ago, we told you on this channel how Ukraine's oligarchs are suffering gigantic financial losses due to Russia's invasion. They've lost billions that many of them already accept they will never see again. And so now the question is, how is the war affecting the Russian oligarchs? Well, look at this. Russian oligarchs lose $95 billion in 2022 amid sanctions after Ukraine war. You heard correctly. 95 billion dollars. Just in the first year of the invasion, 95 billion dollars that have left the new Russian nobility so accustomed to swimming in banknotes, shivering in the shallows. We're talking about oligarchs like Roman Abramovich, the former owner of Chelsea Football Club. In 2022 alone, he lost 57% of his fortune. More than half of his wealth evaporated into thin air as a direct consequence of the invasion of Ukraine. And this is still happening to this day. Right now, for example, you'll find other oligarchs, such as Mikhail Friedman fighting before the very Court of Justice of the European Union to try to free up $16 billion that have been frozen within the EU zone. $16 billion. Outrageous. Visual politic community, we're witnessing a real financial bloodletting for the Russian oligarchs. That's why some of them haven't hesitated, have stepped forward and have done the unthinkable, denounce the Russian invasion and oppose it. From outside Russia, of course, the leader himself. Of course, it's easy to understand their criticism, how well they once lived. Arcadia Voloz, the oligarch and former CEO of the Russian technology giant Yandex, and Anatoly Chubais, former vice president of Russia and entrepreneur of a thousand and one businesses, are clear examples. Because yes, it's true, these are an exception. The vast majority of the country's oligarchs still support Putin. But guess what? Realistically, I dare to think that many would like to see him out of the Kremlin. Of course, some are afraid. Afraid that things will change and they will lose their power, their influence, and even their sources of wealth. You know the old expression, better the devil you know. Well, that's pretty much how it is. Russian oligarchs have reaped their immense fortunes at the feet of the leader Vladimir. And that's precisely why most of them don't want to risk that status for anything in the world. As long as President Putin holds power, he's already made it very clear that it's he who places and removes the oligarchs completely at his own whim. For example, upon coming to power in 2000, Putin gave the management of Rospitprom, a new state-owned company with a monopoly on liquor production throughout the country, to his best friend, Arkady Rotenberg, who would later benefit from hundreds of state contracts contracts from his own bank. SMP Bank. Of course, no oligarch's job is guaranteed. After 30 years at the helm of oil giant Luke Oil, Vajit Alekparov was dismissed and replaced by Vadim Vorobyov, a guy close to the Kremlin. This is how Putin's autocracy works. Power flows directly from him, and any oligarch who deviates from the marked line can be removed without batting an eye. Today, you can be on top. 
but tomorrow fall into the abyss. And guess what? Putin wanted to send a clear message, a warning to all those navigators who might be considering challenging his authority. A direct warning to potential traitors within this new Russian nobility. By the end of 2023, the president made it clear that he would go against those oligarchs whose private companies were seen by the Kremlin as a hindrance, or worse, a danger to his government. And Putin wasted no time in proving it. At the end of last year, he also confiscated 94.2% of the shares of Metafrax Chemicals, a company privatized in 1992, a move that was seen as a warning. And this in itself is another problem for the oligarchs. The war has made the Kremlin give much more weight to the state than to its colleagues, which of course is bad for business. It reduces their influence and their playing field. Be that as it may, Putin's ability to have created a system in which he can do and undo as he pleases is impressive. The oligarchs know him well, and that's why almost all of them tend to play along with the president. They don't want to lose their lives in suspicious circumstances, like Vitaly Robertus, the vice president of Lukoil. They do not want to be imprisoned and then exiled, like Vladimir Guzinski or Mikhail Khodorovsky, the first oligarchs against whom Putin lashed out. And of course, they don't want to lose their privileges and the ability to make money. However, the patience of the oligarchs also has a limit. And that limit may be getting closer and closer. Western sanctions are only increasing, and the war is costing them more and more money. EU adopts 14th sanctions package against Russia. Today, the United States is sanctioning nearly 400 entities and individuals for enabling Russia's prosecution of its illegal war in Ukraine. With this action, the Department of State is imposing sanctions on more than 190 individuals and entities. What do we mean by all this? Well, it wouldn't be strange if there could be a plot among oligarchs to take Putin down. Because frankly, given the circumstances, that would make their life a lot better. Naturally, it would be a terribly risky move. The outcome could only be black or white. It would be a zero-sum game. Either Either Putin falls or the participants in this alleged plot fall, there is no middle ground. And that logically is the best armor for the Russian president. Therefore, although it is possible, perhaps this move isn't the most likely. But visual politic community, the oligarchs are not the only ones who could put Putin in trouble. In theory, the military could be a catalyst for change in Russia. And we don't say that lightly. Since the invasion of Ukraine began, internal tensions within the armed forces have soared. The losses and casualties suffered by the armed forces have been colossal, and this has created deep rifts between some military commanders and the government. Indeed, some officers are known to have privately expressed their dissatisfaction with the strategies being pursued in Ukraine, and also with the stifling corruption that has consumed the Russian military. But above all, it's perhaps the growing indignation among some middle military commanders at the tactics employed by the high command in the war. Tactics such as these. Motorcycles and chaos in eastern Ukraine. In the latest tactic to storm trenches, the Russians use motorcycles and all-terrain vehicles to traverse open spaces at high speed, often amid a hail of gunfire. Here on Visual Politic, we've already told you how one of the latest war tactics being followed by the Russians is to try to define Ukrainian positions by carrying out frontline assaults with platoons moving on motorcycles acting as a target. The Ukrainians shoot at them, and then Russian artillery and drones do their job. The problem is that the casualties are brutal. Most of the members of these platoons do not return alive. They're sent on a mission that borders on suicide. But the Russian high command doesn't give a damn. Not surprisingly, this fuels a growing discontent within the troops and barracks. A discontent that if things don't change in Ukraine, then sooner or later, there could be some kind of uprising. Now, is this really likely? Well, the problem lies in the power structure that Putin has carefully built over the years. The Russian military has benefited for years from extensive state funding, infrastructure improvements, salary increases, particularly for commanders, and certain benefits for military families. The result? a top brass that's relatively loyal to the regime. But that's not all. The armed forces are infiltrated to the core by the omnipresent security services, the FSB. This agency maintains tight control over communications and movements among the uniformed. And that is what explains news items like this one. FSB launches broad purge of military elite with Kremlin approval. The purge of senior officers is the result of infighting between the FSB and the military over the failure to capture Kyiv and competition for defense funds. Putin follows the old Soviet tactic of periodically cleansing the military of all those whose loyalty is in doubt. A classic method of maintaining control and making sure that power is never challenged from within. For example, since the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine, more than 30 generals have been dismissed from their posts. So again, a military uprising would be perfectly possible, but perhaps not particularly 
likely. Do you remember Prigozhin's uprising? It failed because no senior military officer who supported him privately took the step to rise up with him when it came to the crunch. And so we come directly to the third possibility. To what extent could Russian society itself exert sufficient pressure to bring about regime change? Will the Russians crack and take to the streets? In the wake of the invasion of Ukraine and the sanctions imposed by the West, there is one part of the Russian population that has been particularly affected in their day-to-day -day lives, the urban middle class. This segment of society has seen its access to the outside world drastically reduced. Governments and universities around the world have cancelled thousands of scientific and academic projects, limiting many opportunities for collaboration. Services that were part of their daily life, such as Facebook, Netflix, and Zoom, are no longer available. They've lost the ability to upgrade their electronic devices, to access international financial services, and even to obtain visas to travel to Europe or the United States. And of course, many small entrepreneurs have lost big business. This sudden disconnect has naturally made life much more difficult for the more cosmopolitan Russia, because evidently things are not going well. For example, internet searches for terms such as bankruptcy, mortgage refinancing, and check this one, kidney donation have gone through the roof since the invasion began. And searches for depression, anxiety, and suicide have also skyrocketed. In other words, the Russian dream is not as idyllic as it's portrayed on the state news. And that is something that, in one way or another, could wear the state down. Endless war, forced conscription, economic uncertainty, and round-the-clock propaganda have left many Russians in a more than precarious situation. Because it's one thing to support your leader from the comfort of your couch, and quite another to do so when you're thinking of selling a kidney to make ends meet. Well, pay attention, because history gives us a precedent of what could happen. In the 1990s, during the Soviet political crisis, it was precisely this urban and well-to-do urban middle class that took to the streets demanding a change of regime. The question is, could the same thing happen now? Because at first glance, it might seem that we're watching this scenario simmer. And if conditions become even harsher, and frustration continues to grow, it would be easy to think that such a social outburst could be repeated. However, visual politic community, unlike Gorbachev, who tolerated political activism, Putin has been ruthless in his grip on power. Not only has he neutralized opposition figures, such as Alexei Navalny, but he's also implemented draconian laws that criminalize any form of protest or open criticism against the regime. The few demonstrations that have occurred have been quickly quelled by security forces. And then, exorbitant fines, arrests, and intense state propaganda have deterred many from publicly expressing their discontent. What's more, media control and censorship ensure that only the official Kremlin version reaches the majority of Russian households. Russia bans access to dozens of European media outlets. And then there's also another problem. The opposition is concentrated in the large cities, which represent only a quarter of the population. The other three Russias, the poor industrial cities, the declining rural areas, and the multi-ethnic regions, rely heavily on the state for their livelihoods, and still see Putin as a defender of traditional values and national security. So everything indicates that as long as Putin can keep the flow of subsidies and benefits to these regions, his support base will remain more or less intact. Sorry, but we're unlikely to see a popular uprising. Hard to say, but this is not just Putin's war. This is Russia's war. But then again, nothing assures us that Putin's fall will lead us to a better world. Why do I say this? Well, let's take a look at it. And after Putin, what next? Putin's downfall may sound like science fiction. However, history tells us that it's not far-fetched. Would it be good news? Maybe, but maybe not. And this is another thing that generates quite a bit of uncertainty and quite a bit of fear. As you've seen, neither the oligarchs, nor the military, nor society itself clash head-on with what Putin represents. Most of them want to see a strong, respected, and empowered Russia. That's why they support the war. If they have doubts or are angry, it's not because they resent the shelling of Ukrainian cities, but because they consider that things are not being done well. What do we mean by this? Well, there is a fear that a changing of the guard would leave them even worse off. In the minds of some Western analysts, names such as Nikolay Patrushev, the secretary of Vladimir Putin's Security Council, resound. Patrushev is not only one of Putin's closest high-ranking allies, but also one of the Kremlin's hawks. 
That is, he's part of their regime's toughest wing. That's why many fear that, with the arrival of a profile like Petrushev's to power, the war could spread even to NATO territory. And not only that, but that Russia could also start employing tactical nuclear weapons or biological weapons in the war. Whether they are of any use or not, they would signal a huge coup d'etat. And Petrushev was the first to sound the first warning to the West. Russian official warns about growing risk of use of nuclear, chemical, biological weapons. Security Council Secretary Nikolai Patrushev ascribes growing global destabilization to West's attempts to preserve its dominance. Of course, a guy like this could be bad for everyone for the oligarchs, for the military, and for ordinary Russians themselves. But if there's a messy transition, you never know what you will end up with. However, other analysts are much more optimistic. If Putin falls, the regime will fall with him. Power structures, incentives, clientelism, everything will collapse like a house of cards. Then new leaders and a social majority will appear, demanding a drastic change, and they will blame everything on the old president. Could it happen? Yes. In fact, history tells us that this scenario is not only quite common when dictatorships fall, but the most likely. We have plenty of examples with various degrees of intensity, from the Soviet dictatorship, to the military dictatorships in Argentina, to the Franco regime in Spain. In any case, as we have seen, it's most likely that Putin will remain in power for now. Why? Well, because of the intense control he has over the oligarchs, the military, and society itself. But of course, anything can happen. So now that we've reached this point, the question is for you. Do you think Putin will survive in office, even if he fails to win the war in Ukraine? As always, leave us your impressions in the comments undoubtedly the hottest section of the channel. And if you found this video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to Visual Politic. Thank you very much for watching. All the best. I will see you next time.